We're in Galatians, Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. I'd like to start by just reading the passage. We'll look at verses 11 through 15 this morning. Brothers and sisters, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. In 1523, Martin Luther did something that would make even the most ingenious Hollywood producers impressed. He orchestrated the escape of 12 nuns from a Cistercian convent by hiding them in fishing barrels. You can't make this stuff up. Over the following two years, he found himself becoming their matchmaker. It's not a job that he necessarily wanted, but it was the one that he found himself put in. He set them free. Now what was he to do? Well, marry them off, right? They, they came from living in a convent, got out in fishing barrels. That must have been a very delightful experience. And now he's in charge of these 12 nuns, and he starts marrying them off one by one over the next two years. But there was one nun who simply wouldn't be married off. That nun wanted to have a say in who her suitor would be. And who did she choose? None other than Martin Luther himself. Now Luther, up until now, had had no plans whatsoever to get married. He was living a life that he thought would end in martyrdom, and he didn't want to bring a wife along with him in that. That was one of his reasons behind it. But as he sat cogitating this nun's you know, proposition, you could say, um, he concluded to enter matrimony. And here was his, was his reasoning, and I quote, to please his father, to spite the pope and the devil, and to seal his witness before his martyrdom. Those aren't exactly the most romantic of reasons, but reasons enough, I suppose. The nun's name, of course, was Catherine von Bora, soon to become Catherine von Luther, often referred to by Luther as the Mrs. Doctor. Now, I, I want to read a letter that's been preserved from Martin to his wife. Now, this was 20 years into their marriage. Um, they had gone through every hardship and suffering you could ever imagine, whether it be the, the death of a child, the loss of loved ones, constant persecution and threat, for their li threat against their lives, specifically in Martin's case. And, and Catherine had been smeared. She'd been labeled as a harlot and someone who had been living a life of lasciviousness prior to her even escaping the convent. She was smeared to no end. So this was 20 years through all of that craziness. Um, Martin Luther wrote this letter only eight days before his death. And this is a this is a fun little book that I picked up on a, on a website. It's called The Christian Lover. Um, it, ha it takes a look at 12 or so um, Christian theologians like John Calvin and Martin Luther and different people throughout church history who had that letters have been saved between them and their loved one. And it's just a neat little book to pick up every once in a while because it shows a different side to these great theologians. And here's the letter from Martin Luther to Catholic. Katerina Luther, um, his wife, dated February 10th, 1546, again, eight days before Martin passed away. Martin Luther to the holy lady, full of worries. Mrs. Katharina, doctor, the lady of Zolzdorf at Wittenberg, my gracious dear mistress of the house. Grace and peace in Christ, most holy Mrs. Doctor. I thank you very kindly for your great worry which robs you of sleep. Since the date that you started to worry about me, the fire in my quarters right outside the room tried to devour me. And yesterday, no doubt because of the strength of your worries, a stone almost fell on my head 
and nearly squashed me as in a mousetrap. For in our secret chamber, mortar has been falling down for about two days. We called in some people who merely touched the stone with two fingers and it fell down. The stone was as big as a long pillow and as wide as a large hand. It intended to repay you for your holy worries had the dear angels not protected me. Now, I worry that if you do not stop worrying, worrying, the earth will finally swallow us up and all the elements will chase us. Is this the way you learn the catechism in the faith? Pray and let God worry. You have certainly not been commanded to worry about me or yourself. Cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you, as it is written in Psalm 55, 22, and many more passages. Your willing servant, Martin Luther. That shows a different side to him, but it also shows his very bombastic and sar sarcastic tone, doesn't it? He was blaming her worrying for <laughs> the, 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 the near-death experiences he was, he was dealing with. Um, but given that it was eight days before he ended up passing away, not from a rock falling on his head, um, but from, I believe it was heart failure and an apoplectic stroke um, that ended up um, being his demise at the age of 62. But all that to say, um, I, I want to talk today about our ultimate mission. And it's fitting because it's, it's right around this little day called Valentine's Day, right? And our ultimate mission in life is to rescue 12 nuns from the nearest convent, right? Well, maybe, maybe if that's your calling, go for it. But our ultimate mission in life is love. And there we see 20 years of marriage, we see that sarcasm, but we see a deep-grained love where Martin Luther, who originally married uh, Catherine von Bora to spite the Pope and the devil eventually came to, to love her as she was um, and they truly had a wonderful marriage by all account that we have um, and our ultimate mission in life is love and in this text we'll see that God wants us to pursue that ultimate mission uh, let's, let's open in prayer Heavenly Father I pray that you be with us as we open your word this morning that you speak to us through it Lead us and guide us and direct us through the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we're going to look at what love is and what it isn't. Now this isn't going to be an, uh, a comprehensive look at love, but we're going to look at a, a good place to start, I suppose. So in verses 11 and 12 of chapter 5, I see that love is not arbitrary but purposeful. And I do this in a kind of roundabout way. You read in verses 11 through 12, Brothers and sisters, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. What the Judaizers were doing, as we've talked about quite a lot already, is making arbitrary standards. They were saying, well, you have to keep these, these sections of the law, the feast days, circumcision, um, those are things that we have to do. You have to keep the Sabbath. But it was arbitrary. They had no basis for this. They were the ones who decided these are the laws to keep and the other ones we throw out. And Paul was stepping in and saying, there's no room for arbitrary standards. It's either all or nothing. And that's why he goes to the extreme there and says they should just emasculate themselves because they're missing the point of it by just taking taking uh, portions of the law and not taking the whole thing. What we need to glean from this, and I realize it's a kind of roundabout way, but love should not be arbitrary. It should be purposeful. The Judaizers were arbitrarily choosing a standard for attaining favor with God. That's what they were doing. Christ plus these arbitrary works of the law that we're choosing. But Christ purposefully chose the solution for securing favor with God. In essence, love does not flip a coin and say, it'll do. Love focuses on the one and says, I choose you. It's a big difference there. One is arbitrary and one is purposeful. It's driven. There's a reason behind it. And we see this love clearly dis displayed for us 
when we read, when we read 1 John 4.10, this is love. How about that? You want a display of love? Well, John says, look no further than this. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Nothing about the cross was accidental. Nothing about the cross was on a whim. It was purposeful. It wasn't an arbitrary decision on God's part to send His Son as a last minute, I hope this works. It was definite. It was securing and it was purposeful. So first, our love must be purposeful and not arbitrary. Second, love must not be indulgently selfish, but humbly serving. I see this in verse 13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. The reality is that freedom in Christ frees us to love freely. You get that? Freedom in Christ frees us to love freely because we're no longer bound to our culture. We're no longer bound to our, whatever you want to call it, our, our skin color, our demographic. Those aren't things that we can look at as categories anymore because the cross has, has superseded all of those things. And now as Christians, we have people from all demographics that we share in brotherhood and sisterhood with. And people from all centuries that we share in brotherhood and sisterhood with. People who have s cultures that are so different than our own that we can't even begin to fathom that type of lifestyle or even worship style. You go to some churches in, in Africa and I don't know if you've ever seen videos or maybe you've had the opportunity to go there and everyone is standing up and clapping and jumping around and praising the Lord and the service may last for three or four hours where they'll have music, then they'll have a reading of God's word, then they'll have more music, they'll have prayer, corporate prayer. It's something that seems so foreign to us. And yet at the same time, we're all united under the same banner, and that banner is the cross. Freedom in Christ frees us to love freely. Because of what Christ has done, and because of our belief in the finished work on the cross, we are now capable of loving someone with the everlasting love that exists outside of our own capacity to love. Because our love doesn't come from us anymore. You and I know full well that if our love came from us, <laughs> it would run dry on some people. And yet, in those instances where we feel our love running dry because someone has abused our relationship so severely, we no longer can look to our own love, but we have to look at what Christ did for us on the cross and say, God, there's nothing in me that can love this person, but because of what you've done, somehow I'll find a way. Our love for others needs to, be needs to no longer be defined by our own limited capabilities, but by God's omnipotence. And so love is not indulgently selfish. It's not focused on self, but it's humbly serving. Love does not say, how far can I go? How much can I gain? Or how great can I be? Rather, love says, how far can they go and still honor God? You hear the difference there? It's not how far can I go, it's how far can they go and still honor God and be honorable before Him. It, you're not even in the picture it's that other person that you're interacting with. How much can they gain? How great can they be? Hi, buddy. <laughs> Gonna crash the service. The, in, in essence, the lover does not think poorly of himself, nor does he only think highly of the loved. It, love isn't just self-deprecation. Maybe you know some people who are like that. That's not love. It's just, it, in, it, it's really a love for self if you're constantly deprecating yourself because you're, you're holding yourself to a higher standard than you really are and you're not measuring up to that standard and it's really a 
fixation on who you are as opposed to what God has done in you or um, another person. But love does not think poorly of itself, nor does it think only highly of the person, the object of the love. Rather, the lover's self is eclipsed by the radiance of the loved. And thus, self-deprecation and exaltation are altogether removed from his or her thinking. You're so focused on the beauty of the other that it's not even about you anymore. And, and, and I'm talking about specifically big picture looking at Christ. You're so focused on the beauty of Christ that it's not even about you. I think I've used this example before, but any time that you've stood at the top of a beautiful vista, whether it be looking over the horizon at you know, mountains in front of you, or maybe you stood on the edge of the Grand Canyon, you're drawn into something bigger than yourself, and you're lost in it. Now, multiply that by infinity, and that's what heaven will be like when we see our maker face to face, because we'll be lost in his beauty the same way, in a much greater way, than when we're lost in the beauty of creation. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I'll just uh, go on Google Images or something and look up nature pictures. What people have been able to capture uh, with, with cameras is amazing. Um, it just these beautiful displays, whether it be a waterfall in, the, in, the, in South America, in the jungles, or the outer space, photos of a, a nebula or something. It's amazing. And in those instances, you're drawn out into something that's bigger than yourself and greater than you in one sense. So how much greater will it be when that something is God himself. But on a smaller level, that's a big picture, on a smaller level, your love for your spouse or your love for a loved one, that true love is not indulgently selfish, but it's humbly serving. And third, love is not finite, but filling. Verse 14, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's hard for us to realize how shocking that would be to a a, a Jewish Christian reading that. Someone who grew up in Judaism and they had all 614 Jewish laws that they held to. And they knew that there were degrees to the laws. Some were more important than the other. And there, there's, you know, love God and love your neighbor. Those were the pinnacle, right? But to hear all of the law is fulfilled in this one thing, that would have created a little resistance. Like, how can this be? And so in our 21st century, we don't get that same shock and awe that they would have, but try to imagine it, that you're hearing all of these laws, all of the 614 laws that you've been diligent to keep the best you can are suddenly boiled down to one. Love your neighbor as yourself. And that's what love does. It's not finite, rather it's filling, or it's fulfilling. I think an example of this could be um, our love should not be like a, a fuel tank. What happens with the fuel tank? Well, when it gets near empty, or for some people when it gets to half a tank, you go to a gas station, you wince when you see the dollar signs go up, but you fill up the gas tank, right? It's like that over and over and over again. I think a lot of the times we get in a cycle where our love for others is like that, where we're trying to rely on our own strength, on our own efforts, And we have this gas tank, this love tank, if you will, that is constantly getting drained and it's getting close to E. And when it reaches E, oh, you better not be near me because I'm going to explode. Of course, that's the opposite of what would happen. I'm just going to die if I'm using the illustration. Um, My my car is just going to putter to the side of the road and I'll be done. Um, But our love shouldn't be like that, especially since it should be grounded in Christ's love for us. An infinite love something that keeps welcoming us back time and time and time again. Every time we turn our back on him, he's right there beckoning us back to himself. And so often, it's easy to be in a spot where someone wrongs you once, twice, three times, and you just want to shake the dust off your feet and have nothing to do with them ever again. 
Given the circumstances, maybe there should be, be a degree of consequences, but your love for that individual should not be based in their actions. Rather, it should be based in what Christ did. Our love should not be like a fuel tank. Rather, it should be like a fresh mountain spring. And when we rely on Christ's love, it will be that fresh mountain spring which bubbles up within us because it's not confined. It's not something that we have to keep refilling It's filling within us, day by day, moment by moment, but we can only do that in the power of Christ. Jeremiah 31.3, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving devotion. You catch that? An everlasting love. It didn't begin. Even before time itself, God set his love. It, It it, 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 it boggles the mind because we're time-bound creatures, aren't we? We can't think outside of time. And yet God is outside of time, yet he acts in time, time and time again, as we've seen and we see in Scripture. And so for him to say, I've loved you with an everlasting love, it's not just hyperbole, it's, it's literal. Just as he said to Jeremiah earlier on in the book, when you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. I set my love on you. Love is not finite, it's filling. And then I see a warning in verse 15. Verse 15 reads, if you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. And this warning is, lack of love will lead to loss. And you have some some words here um, that is, it's pretty graphic and the apostle Paul is trying to be graphic for a reason as he often does if you bite and devour each other it's as though he's drawing from the animal kingdom where you have these vicious animals that are fighting amongst each other and they're literally taking bites out of each other trying to destroy one another oftentimes when you see these battles between let's say two wolves fighting for supremacy in the pack both wolves end up injured now one of them usually emerges the victor but he may be pretty injured. Maybe he didn't get the neck bite, but maybe his leg was broken in the fight. And then guess what? That gives another opportunity for the third tier wolf to step up and try and take out the alpha because he's injured. And so the Apostle Paul is drawing from this idea of animals just going at it to use it as an illustration to what we often do in a church. We find these ridiculous things to bicker about. And in doing so, we tear at each other just like wild animals tear at each other's flesh. And he's warning us, be careful. Because in doing this, don't be surprised if you get destroyed in the process. So first he describes biting. And some examples of this could be snide remarks. um, Things that are said kind of sarcastically but with a biting tone to them. Some silly examples. I can't believe you actually paid for that dress? Or how could anyone ever confuse diesel for gasoline? Uh, It would would be nice to get out the door, um, it would be nice to get out the door on time for once. Things that are said like that in a sarcastic and biting tone, which sure, you can't really back the person into a corner and say you're a jerk, but in one sense you can. (laughs) Uh, Just because there's, there's that biting nature to it. Um, and, and that's one of the examples of what the Apostle Paul means. So snide remarks and then backhanded comments. Congratulations on your promotion. That's great. Your employer settled for you. It's like, thanks, I, I think. I, I really admire how you don't worry about looking perfect all the time. <laughs> Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, I don't know if anyone has ever actually been told this or have said these things, but these are example of, examples of biting comments. Another very clear cut and dry example is passive aggression. And the Mayo Clinic defines this as a pattern of indirectly expressing negative feelings instead of openly addressing them. There's a disconnect between what a passive aggressive person says and what he or she does. Some examples of being passive aggressive is always playing the victim, incessantly harboring a grudge, unwilling to let something in the past go, even if it's been confessed and supposedly forgiven. 
giving the silent treatment or being overly sarcastic. Those are all examples of biting. The next is described as devouring, and I think this takes it to another level. There was a a study that was conducted, um, I don't remember where or who, but I know it was a a professor of psychology, Um, but they they would take pictures of spousal, spousal interactions between like a husband and a wife or boyfriend and girlfriend, people who are living together, and they would do it over a period of, of years, and they would see their first facial reaction when they saw a picture of their spouse or when they saw their spouse or loved one, whoever it may be, someone they were in a relationship with, doing something. Um, it could be something positive or negative. But they wanted to track the, the look on the person's face And their end goal was to see what look would spell certain doom for the relationship. And believe it or not, it wasn't fear. It wasn't wasn't hatred. It wasn't anger. The emotion that spelled almost certain doom for the relationship was contempt. It was disgust. It was looking at someone this person you loved at one point as less than what they are, usually because of something they did, typically marital in, in unfaithfulness. But that idea of contempt and disgust in a relationship, that's devouring. It, it eats at you as it eats at them because you no longer see that person as an image bearer of God. You see them as, Psh, they're not worthy of my respect. And maybe they're not. But that's an example of devouring. Another example is bitterness. uh, Harboring something. It kind of goes back to what we talked about in biting, but this is taking it to the next level where you're, you're unwilling to let something go and you're letting it grow up. And the problem with bitterness is that you can be bitter against someone and they may not even know it, and yet you're destroying your own life because you're letting that root of bitterness grow up inside of you, as the Apostle Paul talks about. And it's, it's like gangrene spreading to every single area of your life, and that other person may be completely oblivious to it. It's devouring. And then another example of devouring is gossip. Just spreading rumors, whether they be true or unfounded, about other people. And the end result, the Apostle Paul talks about, is destruction of each other. And in this, no party remains whole. Just as we use the example of the wolves fighting for top dog, they all end up a little bit injured. Pieces are torn away from all individuals involved, and loss, though not equally, is experienced by all if there is a lack of love. So we looked at some examples of what love is and what love isn't. First, love is not arbitrary, but purposeful. Love is not indulgently selfish, but humbly serving. Love is not finite, but filling, and lack of love will lead to loss. And to find the greatest display of love, we really need look no further than the cross. A poem which has now been made a hymn, which is beautiful. If you have the time or the opportunity, I suggest you look it up. Um, it's, a, it's a poem entitled, Here is Love, and it was written by William Reese, and the third verse was written by William Williams, I think in circa 1900. Here is love. Here is love vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood, when the prince of life our ransom shed for us his precious blood. Who his love will not remember, who can cease to sing his praise. He can never be forgotten throughout heaven's eternal days. On the mount of crucifixion, fountains open deep and wide. Through the floodgates of God's mercy flowed a vast and gracious tide. Grace and love like mighty rivers poured incessant from above. And heaven's peace and perfect justice kissed a guilty world in love. Let me all thy love accepting love thee ever all my days. Let me seek thy kingdom only and thy life be to thy praise. Thou alone shalt be my glory, nothing in the world I see. Thou hast cleansed 
and sanctified me. Thou thyself hast set me free. God wants us to pursue the ultimate mission, love. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that we have the most powerful example of love displayed clearly for us in the pages of Scripture. That when we were without strength, when we had no desire to come to you, you came down to us and you had the strength to do so and you chose to do so. You didn't do it half-heartedly either. You showed that in, in giving your son. And we thank you for his sacrifice and in bearing the weight of your wrath, which we justly deserved, bearing that weight so we could be restored in a relationship with you. God, I pray that that is the framework we, we build our lives around and we build our love around. Help us not to rely on our own strength and our own love because it will come up short and it will run dry. I pray that you give us the strength we need to look past, God, frustrations we may have with other people, our, our neighbor, um, whoever it may be, and look to the cross and see that person or those people through what you've done. We love you. Help us to love you more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.